again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Mordian Glory video. In today's episode, we shall be doing another tournament after action report. That's right, it's time for more dispatches from the front lines. And oh boy, have I got an interesting one for your viewing pleasure today. Because I took a totally normal, perfectly balanced guard list into the competitive scene. I know, right? Who is this skinwalker who has replaced Mordian Glory? Where is the skew list? Well, the thing is, I have been running a lot of what one might call off meta lists recently. And I thought it would actually be a meme in of itself if I went to a tournament with a perfectly normal army because I never normally do that. On top of this, whilst I love taking a wacky concept like pure infantry and pushing it to the extreme to see how far it can go, I thought that it might be quite useful to the guard and the wider 40k community at large to see how the guard can do when you take them seriously. And so with that mission in mind, I decided once more to stroll into the mist of the meta. You know what? Let's find out how I did. Let's dive right into today's episode. As is tradition, I want to say a big thank you to the tournament organizers, Team Stonehammer, for putting together a fantastic event. It was really good. I've been to a few Stonehammer things over the years, and they've always been on top of their game. The terrain is great. It's been going from strength to strength, and I'll get into that a little bit more in the lay of the land, but this was some of my favorite terrain that I've played on, and they also have all the organization done correctly as well. They've got the pairings done promptly. They've got the timings down to a T. There really is just nothing to fault about it, and I can't recommend their events enough. On top of this, I want to say a a big thank you to the venue Element Games for hosting the event. If you've watched my tournament reports before, you will be as familiar with Element Games as I am at this point. It's one of my favorite places to play and it's just a great game store. They have got a huge shop full to the brim of Warhammer, Bolt Action, many other game systems and all the hobbying and painting supplies you could possibly want. I love to have a cheeky browse in there between games or if I've got a bit of time left over from lunch. In addition to this, they sell drinks and snacks and they offer table service so you don't even need to leave your game to get a little bit of extra fuel in your system. And speaking of drinks and snacks, the best bit, they've got a fully licensed bar so you can have a few beers and have a bit of a chill out whilst you are playing at the tournament. And last but certainly not least, I want to say a big thank you to all of my opponents, Harry, Richard and Henry, for three fantastic games. But with all of that said, let's now get into the video proper and we'll begin with a brief overview of the army list. So I was running what I would call a hybrid guard army list, where I take a mixture of tanks, infantry and artillery. And whilst there is a decent amount of killing power in the list, it's not the overall focus. I do have lots of objective game as well, both primary and secondary. And the idea is that no matter what threat I go into, I should be able to stick to my game plan, score those primary points, score those secondary points and have enough firepower to keep the enemy at bay or even push them back. I have actually done a separate video going through this list step by step in detail. And if you want to check that out, there will be a link down in the description below. But overall, I was running Lord Solar Leontus in a 10 man Katachan squad. And I also had a platoon command squad with a mortar added onto that as well, forming what I've called in the past a supreme command blob. I then had two Death Corps Marshals, and each one of these was leading a 20-man Death Corps of Krieg unit. These Death Corps of Krieg squads had double plasma, no Voxcasters, double melter gun, double grenade launcher, the sergeants had plasma pistol and power swords, and I had a medipack in there as well. 
I then had Colonel Einhan Strachan, and he was in a 20-man Katajan blob. And then I had another 20-man Katajan blob as well. And that was the only infantry unit that didn't have a leader in it. I didn't need a leader in that unit because Strachan can do two orders. So basically, the 40 Katajans stuck with Strachan, and they could all benefit from his double order goodness. To support this infantry corps, I had taken a Rogal Dawn battle tank with a oppressor cannon and coaxial auto cannon, a pulverizer cannon, triple heavy stubber, and double multi melter. I then had two Lemurus exterminators with heavy stubber, hunter killer missile, exterminator auto cannon, heavy bolters in the front, and multi melters. I then had a Lemurus battle tank, which had a heavy stubber, hunter killer missile, las cannon, and plasma cannons. And then we get to the indirect fire and I had a basilisk and two mortar teams. I will admit this was a little bit light on the artillery front, but it ended up being just enough to get the job done. Finally, I had two Cyclops demolition vehicles. These are a little bit of a cheeky bee, a little bit of a sneaky unit. They are 25 points each and According to GW and the law and everything, you're meant to use these to drive into people and blow them up. They're like the old Goliath mines if, you, if you're a World War II fan. However, in 40k terms, they're actually the guard equivalent of spore mines. They're a very cheap unit that you can put into like strategic reserve and it can come on in a tiny area of the board and do some actions. It doesn't matter that the OC0, they are the cheapest way of being able to get things like behind enemy lines and deploy teleporter homer. Just a small side note, if you go and watch the separate video, you will notice that there are some slight differences between that list and this one. I did make some last minute changes. Instead of having two basilisks, I went down to one basilisk and the mortar teams. And instead of having the scions, I went down to the two Cyclops demolition vehicles. I did this because I wanted to be able to have four front line blobs of infantry and the Lord Solar to be in a smaller support blob at the back. There are only small minor last minute changes, but I thought it was best to mention them. Overall, they make the list a tiny bit more efficient, but they don't really impact the performance or the general playstyle of the army. The overall strategy behind the list was to have something that was very tactically flexible that could go into any situation, encounter any army, and play any mission, and have options. Doesn't matter if I face a fast-moving assault force, I've got enough infantry to screen and enough firepower to bring them down. Doesn't matter if I face an elite army, I've got enough objective control to start focusing on scoring points. Doesn't matter if I face someone who's gonna come straight at me, I should be able to have enough units and reinforcements that I can start sneaking into the back lines and still play that secondary game. I also wanted the list to have a lot of redundancies in it. So if I lose one tank, I've still got three left over. If I lose one blob, presuming I can't reinforcement it for whatever reason, I'll still have three left over. I have some artillery. If I lose one of those, I've still got two to three sources of indirect fire in the bank. Basically, I didn't want a situation where someone could just target one part of my list and the rest of the army just falls apart. But that just about sums up the list and the overall plan. Now let's get into the lay of the land. The format of the event was a two-day, five-round competitive GT. Now, some of you might be thinking, two days, five rounds, but MG, you only said thank you to three opponents at the beginning of the video. Did you play the same people a couple of times? Unfortunately, I was not able to make it to both days. I could only attend the first day of the tournament. But as it turned out, on the Saturday, there were three games. So for all intents and purposes, I'll be reviewing this and treating it like it's an RTT. And at the end of the video, I'll give you my placing where I ended up after day one. Over 50 people at the event, making it one of the larger tournaments that I've been to since the start of 10th edition. And the overall quality of player, the skill on display was pretty high. There weren't many beginners from what I could see. In fact, there were quite a few familiar faces, people who I've seen on the tournament circuit for a while that were attending the event. 
And the list that were being brought, generally speaking, were what you would expect from each faction. You saw a lot of Plague Burst Crawlers from Death Guard, for example. You saw a lot of tanks being used by Marines. There was a little bit of variation between the players, people seasoning the different armies to how they prefer, maybe tweaking it a little bit. But like I said, there was no overly meme list, beginner list or skew list. People were bringing their A-game. But the biggest factor at play, and my favorite thing about this tour overall, so much so that I actually complimented the TO's face to face saying how much I loved it, was the terrain they used. I've been playing on a lot of WTC and UKTC style boards. These involve huge quantities of L-shaped ruins and nothing else. These are very, dense and it makes it very difficult to maneuver anything around the board it's impossible to move a guard super heavy out of your deployment zone on those boards but at this event they were using glass hammer terrain this consists of about 70 percent ruins and 30 percent forest which is perfect it's what i have been calling for since the beginning of 10th edition and what it means is there's plenty of places in your deployment zone to hide out of line of sight so someone can't just come in and alpha strike you. But there's actual movement channels. You can get a Bane Blade, albeit only via one path, but you can get a Bane Blade out of your deployment zone. Essentially, you're either going to be out of line of sight, and when you're not out of line of sight, you will be getting the benefit of cover. And it just means that shooting armies can actually shoot without being overbearing. And it means combat armies have still got a couple of different routes of the board where they can hop from ruin to ruin and still get to the enemy. It's, to date, my favorite style of terrain to play on. But that's enough pre-game stuff. I know why you're all really here. Let's get into the battles. Game number one was against Harry and his Death Guard. In his list, he had a Death Guard Sorcerer in Terminator armor, a Lord of Virulence, Typhus, and Mortarium. He had 10 Death Guard Cultists, a big unit of six Death Shroud Terminators, another unit of three Death Shroud Terminators, three Blight Haulers with Missile Launcher and Multi Melter, three Plague Burst Crawlers with the Mortar and the two Plague Spitters. He didn't have the Entropy Cannons. And then he had 10 Pox Walkers and 20 Pox Walkers. And it was the big blob that was being led by Typhus. And then three cheeky little Nurglings. The deployment was Dawn of War. The mission was Take and Hold. And the twist was the ever-exciting Chilling Rain. But speaking of deployment, I ended up putting all of my Kastjans with Strachan on my right flank because they were able to hide out of line of sight with their scout moves. They'd start off out in the open, but then scout move behind a big ruin, which would also help them get onto one of the mid-board objectives early on as well. Also on that flank, I had one of my exterminators and my Lehman Russ battle tank. In the middle, behind a big ruin, I had my artillery. So my mortars, my supreme command blob, and my basilisk. I also had the rogue dawn, but that was just poking a little bit behind the ruin so that it was getting the benefit of cover. But I was fairly confident, even with the amount of shooting in my opponent's list with those blight haulers, that the dawn would be able to take it. It's a pretty tough beast. Finally, over on the left-hand side, I had all of the Krieg supported by one of the Lehman Russ Exterminators. As for the Death Guard deployment, this is all from my perspective. On the right-hand side, opposite my Katachans, he had 10 Pox Walkers. And then the vast majority of his army got crammed behind that big L-shaped ruin in the middle. That consisted of most of his plague burst crawlers his mephetic blight haulers and the big blob of 20 pox walkers and mortarium he then couldn't quite fit all of his armor behind that so one of the mephetic blight haulers ended up being out in the open but it was in a forest and then one of his plague burst crawlers was also on the left hand side with 10 of his chaos cultists the cultists were doing similar to my cast chance where they were going to start off out in the open but thanks to their scout move they would easily be able to push forward onto the 
uh, sort of behind the, the ruin in front of them, keeping them safe. So they weren't actually in a bad position whatsoever. In reserve, my opponent had all of his death shrouds. The big blob was being led by the Lord of Virulence and the little squad was being led by the Terminator Sorcerer and he also had three Nurglings in reserve as well. The only things that I put in reserve and in fact the only things I put in reserve the entire tournament was just my two Cyclops Demolition Vehicles. Their whole job was to just come in either turn two or turn three and sit in a little corner in my opponent's deployment zone and wait for objectives like behind enemy lines, teleporter homer, that kind of thing to pop up. We then rolled for first turn, and amazingly, I get it. I never get first turn in my tournaments. I think the last time I got it was in the Scion tournament. It's just not a thing. I just I always presume and I always deploy as if I was going second. But I went first, and I'm pretty happy with that because obviously my opponent's got a lot of deep strikes, so the earlier that I can get a wiggle on, the more I can push him back. On the right flank, the Kachans did what they're going to do, and they scout moved forward six inches, and then they moved forward another six inches. This basically meant that I had between 20 and 30 Kachans between the two blobs sat on that right hand objective from turn one. So that was good, got that one locked down. The main plan was to kind of sit on the two middle objectives. I only really needed two objectives including my home one to score the 10 primary points that you get with this mission but I want to try and deny my opponent some primary and force him to go into the middle because the middle there's no ruins there's forest who will get the benefit of cover but he won't be able to hide out of line of sight I want to make that middle a bit of a killing zone so the Katachans do their job and they move on to the objective on the right uh, and the Kriegers do their job and they move on to the objective on the left we then get to my shooting phase now the cards that i had drawn my secondaries were bring it down and overwhelming force i considered bidding off overwhelming force because i wasn't going to get it turn one but my opponent is going to move on to objective so i think look i'll keep it if i still haven't scored it by the end of turn two then i'll bin it off but I also get Bring It Down, which is really, really easy for me to get because there's a Mephetic Blight Horde just sat out in the open. And so the guard tanks begin to unload. Now, some of them had moved and the exterminators weren't in rapid fire range. So I didn't have as much firepower as I would have liked, but I still had a Rogal Dawn that had stayed still. And I still had a Lemus Battle Tank that had stayed still. I put Take Aim on my Rogal Dawn, one exterminator and my battle tank. And I started firing. I began with the Rogal Dawn and I fired my four shots and I got one hit. My opponent did pop a stratagem so that it was minus one to hit, but still I got two. Then I was wounding him on fours with twin linked. I roll to wound, I fail, I re-roll it. And I fail. Hunter killer missile goes off. Rolls a one to hit. The bolter goes off. Rolls triple one to hit. Oh dear. 180 points of battle tank has just unloaded and not even scratched the paint. At least it had put withering hail on the better black order. So hopefully the rest of my army should be able to pick up the slack. I go to roll the number of shots from the battle cannon and I roll a one. The Lehman Rust battle tank then does nothing. It just doesn't hit with everything. Last cannon misses, plasma cannons miss, hunter killer misses, heavy silver misses, battle cannon misses, even we were one it just misses. So I've just had 360 points with a tank, not able to chip off a single wound from a light buggy. Rogal Dawn then goes, and I roll a number of shots for its main gun. And you probably guessed it, I roll a one. Rogal Dawn unloads with everything it's got and proceeds to get one shot through on the light hauler, managing to bring it down by three wounds. 
I then proceed to unload the basilisk and the mortars and any other spare firepower that can possibly see this thing. But either I roll cold or my opponent makes his saves. And the end result is probably a thousand points of guard firepower unload into this single small vehicle and it lives. It does only live with one wound left, but it does live. This is quite a big deal because not only had I tunnel visioned onto this thing, which was the right move because it is worth victory points, but not only had I tunnel visioned onto this thing, meaning that I hadn't done any damage elsewhere to my opponent's army, but it also meant that now I didn't clear that secondary. So now I've got to hold onto that for next turn, meaning that I score no points in turn one, which is not a great start to the game. My luck was cold. My opponent even said to me that he'd got away with it there. He was very surprised that that Blight Hauler didn't die. But there we are. <laughs> Onwards and upwards, surely, right? We then go over to turn one for the Death Guard, and they're pretty ballsy. Mortarian, a Plague Burst Crawler, and the 20 Pox Walkers led by Typhus begin to move into the middle of the board. Mortarian goes the furthest forward, and he's able to get a toe onto that middle objective. Another one of the Plague Burst Crawlers goes towards the left flank and starts unloading its Plague Flamers into the Kriegers over there. And basically, he was putting his Plague Flamers into the Kriegers whilst putting his Mortars into the Catachans. The end result is he cuts Draken's Blob in half and he cuts one of the Krieg Blobs in half as well. His Mephetic Blight Hall, despite, despite the fact that they're only armed with crack rockets and that most of the multi melters aren't in range, are actually able to get a decent amount of wounds through um, on my armor. It didn't help the fact that I had done three wounds to myself with hazardous rolls on the Lemur's Battle Tank. So by the end of round one, whilst I am sat on three objectives, I've done no damage to my opponent and he is now in the middle. And he is one turn, realistically, one or two turns away from being able to get a big push into my back lines. He's being aggressive and he's taking advantage of my bad luck, which is exactly what he should be doing. My opponent was also able to score one of his secondaries uh, and then he binned off one of his other ones. But then we get into battle round two and surely this was when the guard were going to strike. Their firepower was going to punish the enemy for their hoovers. They have strode forth too confidently and now we shall show them the wrath of the emperor. Things actually started off fairly well. The Krieger blob on the left that had taken some casualties actually brought back three guys, which is nice. And then they moved forward around the side of the left-hand ruin and were able to see the cultists and bring them down. Excellent. We also were able to use a cheeky uh, melter gun shot, or I think it was a crack grenade that actually got the final wound through and was able to bring down the injured, the one wound Mephetic Blight Hauler. So good job, those 10... The 10 Kriegs did a great job. Plus one to hit, then take aim. So they're hitting on twos. They really are able to you know, clean up the 10 cultists and get rid of the, the injured Blight Hauler. The 20 Kriegers that were following them up, the second wave, they simply moved, moved, moved onto the objective and just locked it down the left-hand side. On the right, it was rinse and repeat. The remaining Catachans of Strachan moved forward. They flamed the Pox Walkers, killed a couple of them, then charged in, and Strachan was able to kill... Basically, the remaining Pox Walkers single-handedly, so that was good. The other 20 minion of cast chance followed them up, and they took their place on the right-hand objective. Then things went a little spicy, because my opponent used Rapid Ingress. I don't know why, I can just never remember that that stratagem exists. And the big blob of Blight, I want to say Blight Laws, Death Shroud, with the Lord of Villains, dropped down. That was a great move by my opponent, because... It meant that he was able to then, in his turn, move forward and not, and then get a much easier charge on the Kachans on that objective. Rather than a 9-inch charge, he's now looking at like a 5-inch charge. In the middle, uh, I wanted to screen my opponent out from the middle objective, make it a bit difficult for him. And because I've obviously screened the left and the right with my aggressive infantry, I took one of my mortar units that were hiding behind my L-shaped ruin and Move and move them into the middle, just as far forward as they could go. 
which meant that my opponent couldn't then deep strike his death shroud in a really threatening position. So movement was good. The flanks were good. I'd got to bring it down. Now, just to get overwhelming force and max out, bring it down, I needed to kill Mortarium. Mortarium's a big lad, but he's tough, but he ain't invincible. And bear in mind that he was facing down four Imperial Guard tanks that now had all of their melters in range, had stayed still, so they all had lethal hits, and all of the auto cannons were now in rapid fire range as well from the exterminators. So I was feeling pretty confident. I've played against Mortarion a couple of times now in tournaments, and, you know, I brought him down with a lot less than that. I fire and fire and fire and fire, and it, Mortarion gets brought down to one wound. I unload. The last shot to go into him is a heavy stubber, which is benefiting from fields of fire and also withering hail. And it gets two auto wounds through. My opponent fails both of his armor saves, but then makes both of his fire but feel no pains. Ah, I was so clutch. The 50 cal almost got Mortarion, but not quite. Again, this was a bit of a pisser for me because it had absorbed a lot of my firepower and I'd not got what I wanted to get done. It meant I didn't max out bring it down. It meant that I didn't clear overwhelming force as well which then put me in a difficult position because do I do I keep overwhelming force limiting my secondary potential? Um, but by doing that, it really messes with my, with my opponent because if you lose more time, I'm going to overwatch him and probably get that last wound off him. Or do I bin it off, give my opponent the freedom to go nuts with Mortarion, but giving me the potential to maybe pick some better cards later? I end up deciding that I'm already, gonna, I'm already looking at a a turn three, turn four, turn five victory rather than a turn one, two victory. So I end up keeping overwhelming force and decide to play the long game. One of the other big problems with this was because I had put all of my tanks and then my mortars and stuff into Mortarians, I hadn't put my Basilisk into the Death Shroud, which I really wanted to do because they're on a five inch charge now from when, you know, when they move. But if I put the Basilisk into them, it minuses their movement, putting them down to a two inch move. And it also minuses two from their charge, which actually puts them back on a nine inch charge, something I really, really wanted to do. But I just had to get rid of Mortarion. I had to make him really, really, really dead or damaged. And so I missed out on that opportunity. Again, just an example of if you're if your luck just bottoms out. And again, I was rolling ones on the number of shots from things. I was just missing left, right and center. Uh, you know, I definitely should have killed Mortarion, but between my opponent having slightly above average luck, like he would roll three, four up invulnerable saves and consistently make two out of three. He would roll three feel no pains, consistently roll, you know, get two out of three of them. So between my opponent's luck being slightly above average and my luck being significantly below average, it was having a quite a big knock on effect. But there's no point in crying over spilled milk. We've just got to grit our teeth and go for that long game win aim for turn three turn four turn five and just hope that the luck turns around eventually death guard turn two and it kind of went how it, it, i expected it to death shroud charged into the cash chance and obliterated them and then what happened was there was a plague burst crawler over on that right flank which ended up flaming and uh, mortaring and there's some other support fire from other plague burst mortars that went into Strachan's mob and brought them down to just Strachan and one guy. And then that plague burst crawler that was on the right flank charged in and it killed the last uh, Kachan there. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough CP to bring back Kachan's in uh, both units and it both happened in the um, charge phase anyway so I was only able to bring back one unit and that meant that I did actually take 20 permanent casualties but what was funny is Strachan ended up basically tanking uh, the remaining wounds that went on to him from the Plague Burst Crawler it killed the one guy and then he passed his save and then he proceeded to take six wounds of the Plague Burst Crawler. And my opponent was quite impressed by that. Strachan just managed to just roll really hot, which was very nice. 
On the left hand side, my opponent I continued to use his play bonus corners aggressively. And he had another one that flamed and then charged the Kriegers. But they were able to survive that thanks to the feel no pain. And so I ended up having uh, about six or seven of those guys left. I only lost about six of them to the flamers and the um, and the charging. They didn't do any damage to the play bonus corner in combat though, obviously. In the center, my opponent decides not to move Mortarium. And to be honest, it was a catch-22 for him. Because either he moves Mortarium, at which point I get the opportunity to overwatch. I kill Mortarium, that clears overwhelming force for me. And then I can draw two cards in my turn three. Or he stays still and Mortarium doesn't do anything, but at least doesn't die. And that kind of screws over my secondary game a little bit. If he had moved forward and I had Overwatch, I wouldn't have been able to use reinforcements though. And he would have been able to clear away 40 Guardsmen permanently. But I think overall my opponent probably made the lesser of two evils. He probably made the right call. Because Mortarion, even though he only has one wound left, with a little, little luck, could absorb a bit more firepower. The Plague Bros Crawl of the third one just sort of sat there in the middle as well and they were kind of just locking down the center and it was then that typhus moved forward moved in advance got a big advance forward and was able to lead his big 20 man poxwalker squad onto the center so at the end of battle round two the tables have turned my opponent now holds the middle objective comfortably with a lot of oc and he's got a big block of death route holding the right hand objective as well i'm holding the left but I'm now on the back foot. But turn three is where I turn this franchise around. On the right, I just shell his Death Shroud with my Basilisk, and that just slows him down. They've now got a two-inch move, and if they advance, if they roll a one or a two, it, it doesn't help. They're not going anywhere, basically. Shrakken continues to wail on the Plague Burst Crawler, and actually he is able to take another four wounds off it i think bringing it down to like just two wounds Strachan was just clanging on that hole with his devil's claw on the left hand side um the krieger stay in combat with the playbus core because i don't want to fall back and for it to overwatch me and they actually regenerate three guys back into the squad so they're able to sit there with about 10 blokes in the unit with take cover on them with the feel no pain just Tying that Plague Burst Crawler up, essentially. The other 20-man Krieger Blob comes over through the Ruin and gets line of sight on Mortarion, the Plague Burst Crawler, and the Poxwalks and Typhus that are sat in the middle. Speaking of the middle, I unload. And Mortarion goes down. I think it's to the... I think it's just to the infantry squad, you know. It's the Krieg unit. They just take aim, and I think a cheeky melter gun goes through and is able to bring down Mortarion. I, I get the big six on the damage, and I'm in melter range. So he fails his save, and he goes down, which is which is brilliant. He doesn't explode. And the rest of my firepower clears all of the Pox Walkers and Typhus, and I'm even able to put some fire onto uh, one of the remaining Blight Haulers as well. The Plague Burst Crawl that's in the middle, I don't actually destroy that. I think I do a little bit of damage to it, but I don't destroy it because I want to charge it and then get onto the middle objective, doing a big swingaroo because my opponent's Poxwalkers had made that a sticky objective as well. But one of the major turning points was my reserves. My opponent made a key mistake. He moved off his backfield objective because it had been stickied by the Poxwalkers in the first turn. And... My opponent thought that you couldn't come on from any board edge turn three with reserves. I thought that it still excluded your opposing player's board edge, which meant that my Katachan just came on and took his home objective off him. I did apologize to my opponent. and I did say to him that if I had seen he had moved off there, I would definitely have told him that I could do this. But because it was a big L-shaped ruin, I just presumed he'd left something on there to screen me out. But he hadn't. And my opponent took it like a champ. He said, no, no, I've learned something from that. That's fine. I'll wear it. But it did mean that at the end of turn three, my turn three, my opponent was only on one primary point. And in the third round for the Death Guard, really their luck kind of bottomed out. My opponent tries to move an advance of Death Shroud, but he rolls a one on the advance. So they literally move two inches and don't go anywhere. 
The Nurglings drop down and fail a charge on the Exterminator. This was important because my opponent could have got behind enemy lines with that. And then the Plague Burst Crawlers, one of them actually, one of them on the right that's facing Strachan actually falls back. because It's got two wounds left and Strachan is just going to take it out. So even though Strachan didn't actually kill the Plague Burst Crawler. I like to think that he gets the moral victory because he did force a demon engine to flee in terror from him. He's such a badass. Unfortunately, Strachan did not live to celebrate his victory. The uh, One of the one of the Blight Haulers came around and multi-melted him and he, he just failed his vulnerable save and died, sadly. Maybe that's kind of my opponent's turn. His other unit of Death Shroud dropped down and uh, fail to get the charge off on the Kriegers that are in the perpetual combat with the um, final uh, Plague Burst Crawl that's on the left. And that was big because they were kind of stuck out in the open. And if turn three was the beginning of the fight back, turn four essentially solidified the game in the guards' favour and ensured victory. Because a lot of my opponent's units have taken a bit of scattered fire here and there and were a little bit damaged or were now fully committed to the fight where I could see them. And finally, my firepower had turned on. So turn four, I finish off both Plague Burst Crawlers. One that's in the uh, on the left-hand side that's fighting the um, Kriegers over there. And that one gets picked up by a Lemurus Exterminator. Then there's another Plague Burst Crawler that's in my face, the one that was near the middle. That gets picked up by um, one of the other battle tanks. Just so I think the, the Rogaldorn's multi-melters and then another exterminator's multi-melters basically picked that one up. The Death Shroud that are on the right-hand side just get Bathus again. They're not going anywhere. And the Death Shroud that had just popped in and failed their charge get hit by a long-range Lehman Ross exterminator. Just sat there, just peppering it up, just getting it ready for the, uh, the other units to come in. And it kills three of the Death Shroud. My opponent just fails three two-up saves, gets triple one, has no CP to re-roll it. And yeah, that just wipes the unit out. And then the sorcerer just gets picked up by something else. And so my firepower went from being absolutely abysmal to probably just above average turn three and turn four. And by the end of turn four, when the dust has settled, my opponent has a two-wound Plague Burst Crawler that is fleeing from Strachan. He's got a Blight Hauler. And he's got six dash rails that can't do anything. They just sat there just getting movement cooked constantly. And I am now in control of his home objective. I am in control of the objective from the left. I'm in control of the objective from the middle. And I'm in control of my home objective. Turn four, my opponent fires off a few missiles from a blight hauler. And that's essentially it. And then the TO comes over and says, we've got about 20 minutes left. And I said, I said to my opponent, oh, cool, we can do turn five. Uh, my opponent just says, you know what? It, it's not going to make a big difference. Do you just want to talk out the final turn? And I'm like, yeah, no problem then. There's no point in sat there like twisting the knife. So I draw my last two cards. I can score both of them. My opponent draws his last two cards. He can score one of them. And so we tally up the final points. And it ended up being a pretty comfortable victory for his Imperial Guard. For those curious, the final score was 59 to the Death Guard and 80 to the Imperial Guard. That might sound like a relatively low score, the Death Guard, but I think the problem that they had is they scored okay on their secondaries in the first couple of turns. But turn two, they got 10 primary, but turn three, they only got five. And same for turn four and five. Whereas the guard consistently just got 10 primary every turn. And whilst our secondary game was poor at the beginning, it really turned around. Once I was basically in three quarters of the board for three turns, my secondary game was fine because anytime anything came up, I just went, oh, I've got a unit nearby that can do that action or can cleanse that objective or can just move into there and get engaged. Whereas my opponent found that turn three, turn four, turn five, he rapidly ran out of assets. So his secondary game became a lot harder. But let me tell you guys, whilst I might sound cool, calm and collected with the benefit of hindsight, at the time, I was so sure I'd lost that game. After turn one and two, and I had killed 10 cultists, and like 10 pox walkers, that was it. I thought there's no way I'm gonna turn this around. Like my, my dice just aren't on it today. And my opponent 
if my luck hadn't turned around, turn three would have won that game. Absolutely. He was in a position to start getting into my tanks, into my lines. My screens were collapsing. It was a very, very precarious position, but I just got the firepower when I needed it. And I tell you what, man, that is one of the biggest turnarounds I've had in any game, competitive or casual. But with one surprise victory under our belts, it was then time to go on to game number two. And it was going to be a classic matchup. Any fans of the film Aliens and Starship Troopers are going to be happy to hear about this pairing because it was the Imperial Guard versus the Tyranids. And my opponent for game two was Richard. And in his list, he had a Neuro Tyrant, Death Leaper, a Winged Tyranid Prime, then three units of 10 Gargoyles, a Biovore, three Neuro Lictors, a Pyrovore, five Tyranid Warriors with melee weapons, three Von Ryan Leapers, five Zonothropes, and then an Exocrine and two Norn Emissaries. I have to admit that this list vexed me. I was terribly vexed because not only have I not faced the new Tyranids yet, but on top of that, I've not faced Vanguard Onslaught and I know how sneaky they are. And this was unlike any Tyranid list I had come across before. Half of the units in it had lone optive, at least that's what it felt like. And the ones that didn't have lone optive, if I move towards them, they can move away. If I go close to them, he can make something lone optive. It was, it was wild. And at the end of the fight phase, units could go back into reserve. Overall, I would describe this list as tricksy. Tricksy Tyranids. To be totally fair to Richard, he did a fantastic job of making sure that I knew what his list could do and no point did he gotcha me. This is the kind of army that against a certain kind of player, they definitely could bamboozle you and catch you out at every single twist and turn because it just seems to be able to do lots of crazy shenanigans. But Richard was an absolute gent and... At no point did I feel like I'd been gotchered. Now, the deployment for this game was sweeping engagement. The mission was priority targets and the twist was supply lines, which I couldn't really benefit from because the Lord Soul is already giving me a bonus CP. We then started chucking our units down onto the table for deployment and I decided to keep things simple. I was a little tentative at first, but I thought, you know what? The last thing I want to do is let this list get inside my head. Let's just stick to our game plan and not worry about their tricks. We'll deal with them as and when they come up. So I put my Kriegers on the right flank with the Rogal Dawn and uh, one of the Exterminators. I then put another unit of Kriegers in the middle behind the L-shaped ruin because I want to push onto the middle objective with that one. And also behind the L-shaped ruin, I put the command blob and the mortars. You guys know, I hide the artillery behind that thing. The only change to my normal deployment was the basilisk went in the far back corner because it could screen out anything that was going to try and deep strike down there. And my opponent's long range shooting was pretty minimal, to be fair. On my left flank, Strachan and both Cassian blobs went down there with the exterminator and the battle tank supporting them. As for the bugs, they put a unit of gargoyles on the right and also a neuro lictor. They then had another unit of gargoyles and another neuro lictor in the middle and both Norn emissaries were kind of on either side of the big L-shaped ruin in their deployment zone. They were going to make a beeline for a couple of objectives. As for the Tyranids, they put a Neuro Lictor and a unit of Gargoyles on the right. Behind the big L-shaped ruin, they put the Exocrine, the Warriors, the Biovore and the Neuro Tyrant. They also had a Emissary behind there as well. They then had another Emissary that was kind of towards the middle left and then a Death Leap and another Neuro Tyrant. And then on the Far left, they had a Neuro Tyrant and also the Von Ryan's Leapers. In reserve, there were the Zonothropes and another 10-man squad of 
Gargoyles. We then roll off the first turn, and the Xenos Menace sees the initiative, spurred on by some sort of synaptic imperative from the hive mind, and it's a big old surge. Both unit of Flappy Flappy Gargoyles come flying forward and between their moving and then their shooting and they can jump shoot jump they actually get right in my face and my opponent's plan is to have a line of essentially 20 gargoyles completely move block me on my right flank and in the middle and it is somewhat effective he then takes both of his non emissaries and he puts one onto the middle objective and he puts one onto the right hand objective the big move and advance the neuro lictors stay still death leaper also stays still and the rest of his army kind of just hides behind the big ruin the big news from the turn one because i didn't really take any casualties i think one krieger died which just made the rest of the squad very angry the big news was that strachan died i know he died turn one i was very sad I have to stop overhyping Strachan. I just get so excited about him. I keep telling you how awesome he is, but it keeps meaning he dies very quickly. <laughs> so what happened is the Von Ryans just came through the wall, charged into Strachan's mob, and then used precision. They used a stratagem for precision, and then they killed Strachan. And I don't think my opponent would have gone for the precision if I hadn't been sat there just essentially espousing my love affair with Strachan. <laughs> but the, I, I did, and so my opponent killed him. And to be fair, it was probably the right move because uh, without Strachan, the Katachans only did one or two wounds in return to the, uh, the Leapers. But that was it for turn, in turn one. I lost one Krieger and the Bionic Man, but we had the technology, we can rebuild him. So whilst I was a bit sad that Strachan died, really I'd got off quite lightly in terms of damage. I proceed to issue move, move, move to most of my infantry, which allows me to circumvent a lot of the move blocking shenanigans that the Tyranids have tried to employ. My Catachans that were in combat with the Von Ryan Leapers fall back onto the objective and the unit of Catachans following up behind them, essentially flame and lasgun them off the board. I think they needed a little bit of help from some spare multi-melter shots from the exterminator but it wasn't in range of anything else anyway so i've cleared away the von ryans which is good and then i clear away all of the gargoyles easy peasy most of the stubbers from the tanks and heavy bolts and stuff just rip through them without much effort and we then get to the main show which was the firefight against the norn emissary now this big bug was the one in the center the one on the right, I couldn't really do much about. And I also figured that if my opponent moves off the objective to come and attack me, he's not going to be able to hold it. So he's kind of put his big bugs on the objectives. And I think he's relying on them being supremely tanky to be able to hold that objectives. And to be fair, they are very, very durable. They've got good toughness, a lot of wounds. A 4 plus avoidable save, a 5 plus feel no pain. It really did take a lot for me to uh, do any damage to them. The Rogal Dawn opens up and does all right, but a bit like in the Death Guard game, my opponent's getting lucky on, on the lucky side of average with the invulnerable saves and the, and the feel no pains. But after all the tanks had fired, the central neuro tyrant was on five wounds. And I only had one thing left to shoot at it, which was the Krieg blob that had been hiding behind my L-shaped ruin. Now they had moved, moved, moved. And the plan was that they were gonna move out there and I was originally going to charge the gargoyles and then consolidate onto the middle objective. And I sh should be able to do something about it. But bear in mind, this big beastie is like OC, like 15 or something crazy. So actually it I may not have been able to take the objective from it. But I'd killed all the gargoyles a bit easier than expected. So the only target that was left was the Norn Emissary in the middle. And I asked my opponent, I was like, okay, so how much damage does this thing do in combat? And he's like, well, it's got six attacks. And I was like, what about if it sweeps? He says, no, it doesn't have a sweep. It's got six attacks. But well, I've got four more, like, as well, from, like, the tail or something secondary. I was like, it's got ten attacks. And he took me through it. I was like, I'm pretty certain that I'll be able to weather that and if i charge this thing then 
I'll be able to get like 40 OC on the objective, even if it hits with every attack and wounds with every attack. I'll still have 10 Kriegers and the officer on the objective. That's still 21 OC to me. So I should be all gravy, baby. But I thought, you know what? I'll soften it up first. I'll I'll try and shoot it because I have only moved, moved, moved. I've not advanced. Yeah, I'm only hitting on fours, but I'll try and soften it up and maybe take a few wounds off it. And hell, who knows? Maybe a bayonet charge. Maybe it'll finish it off. Bring it down, as it were. Fix bayonets, man. Equip bayonets. But like I said, we give it a volley first. And I just fire two Malticons. And I get two hits. And that's quite nice. And then I get two wounds. I'm like, wow, that is very nice. Because I'm hitting on fours, wounding on fives. Like, okay, nice. My opponent passes one of the invulnerable saves, but fails one. But he's got like a five plus feel no pain. And I'm not in melter range. I'm in 12 inches, but my melters are slightly out of position. I roll the dice and I get a six on the number of damage. And I'm like, yes, baby, that's cool. I'm like, definitely, he'll probably pass a couple of them and maybe, maybe three of them. And I'll be able to uh, bring it down to like one wound and maybe finish it off with a glorious bayonet charge. My opponent rolls his feel no pains. and just doesn't make any of them. It turned, the worm turned. And rather than being on the lucky side, he actually got very unlucky with his Phil No Pains. Didn't make any of them. And the Norn Emissary was brought down by a Melter Gun. Yes, boys! Let's rock! Eat this! I just love, I was literally just... One thing I should say is, my opponent was very much into aliens, just like I am. So we were trading back and forth aliens quotes the entire time. And whenever he used the lone operative stratagem that made his own operative like six inches, one of us would be like, maybe they don't show up on infrared. <laughs> but um, I brought the Norn Emissary down with just a cheeky Death Corps of Krieg Melter Gun. And I like to think that it was an old, it was an old school Metal Cadian Melter Gunner. The one from the command squad way back in the day when Cadence got their first do over in like fourth edition. And I just like to think that he's surrounded by all of these grizzled, he's surrounded by all these new, these new conscripts. And he's like a grizzled veteran. And he just he says, Don't worry, lads. Faced one of these big boys before. Brought one down on Triplex Foul. So sort he of lines up his mail gun, lets off a superheated beam, takes it right in the throat. The beast falls down with a cry and as it collapses to the ground and dust goes everywhere as the dust settles all that can be seen is the glow of the melter barrel and the glow of the big stogie that the melter gunner just lit on the end of it <laughs> so that was really cool but it was a very very durable unit uh but i kind of got the measure of it now which was they were tough, but they weren't unkillable. My four tanks could get the job done, and with a little bit of infantry support, it was almost guaranteed that I could bring down one of his big monsters a turn. Turn two for the Nids was pretty quiet, to be fair. Over on the right, nothing happened. The Norn Emissary stayed on the objective because it had to for my opponent to continue scoring primary. In the center, Death Leaper came out to have a go at the Kriegers. And on the left... I think the Neurolictor forced a Bowshock test, which I asked. That was really it. And then my opponent was launching Spore Mines all over the place to do his secondary. So his secondary game was fine. But Death Leaper essentially went into combat with the Kriegers in the center, munched five or six of them. And then that was the end of turn, turn two. My opponent really was not being overly aggressive and he instead was content to use all of his sneaky tricks to just only feed me little bits of his army that he didn't mind losing i think the plan was that if he went all out he was afraid he'd get blown off the table but by just feeding me a little bit at a time he was kind of choosing his casualties however i was totally okay with being fed my opponent's army piecemeal because it would allow me to defeat it in detail on the left i consolidated 40 cash chans onto that objective up there that was now comfortably going to be mine in the middle the kriegers had moved back they'd fallen back from death leaper onto the middle objective so that one's in my control now 
And, oh, little side note. Death Leaper hadn't been able to use his precision attacks against Death Call Marshall because he was out of line of sight. A little known thing is that precision, even if it's in combat, still needs line of sight to pick out the character. And my Death Call Marshall had still been behind the L-shaped ruin. I'd conga line my guys out a little bit. So I was able, therefore, to use move, move, move to fall back nine inches onto the central objective, getting quite a lot of bodies on there. And then on the right-hand side, I brought down the Norn Emissary. It was a little bit less epic this time. I just ended up shooting it with everything that I had, mortars, basilisks, uh, rogal dawns, exterminators, everything went into it. And again, it is a tough old beast, but a whole guard army opens up on a single unit. Yeah, it's going to go down. The one funny thing that happened was um, I forgot about my opponent's ability to do the six inch lone operative. And so I fired the multi melters from one of my exterminators, which I'd pushed into the center to support the Kriegers. And I fired that into uh, Death Leaper. Death Leaper passed his invulnerable saves and then my opponent went, right, now I'm going to use the lone operative thing. So not only the tanks could pick him up. So Death Leaper actually survived, even though he was stood out in the middle, literally wiggling his bum at me. Turn three for the Nids come around and they're starting to run out of assets. They've got Neuralictors that are all over the place, but they're kind of just hiding and trying to bow shock me. And it, it, sometimes they're bow shocking me, sometimes they're not, but I'm putting multiple units onto objectives. So even if they do battle shock, I'm able to retain control of said primary objective. But they did go for a bit of a bigger blow this turn. The warriors came out from behind my opponent's big L-shaped ruins deployment zone and they slammed into the Kriegers and they killed every last one of them and the Death Call Marshal just wiped them out. I was able to use reinforcements on them to bring them back though. That was really it. Death Leaper was there as well. He joined in the fight and the Warriors took out the Kriegers. The right hand side, there's nothing left there now. There's like one Neuralictor hiding behind uh, a ruin. The Gargoyles dropped down in support of the Neuralictor, but I think my opponent was too focused on trying to keep his blokes alive. Remember, you can lose a game of 40k. Also in the center, my opponent had brought on his Zone of Throats from Strategic Reserve on the board edge that was near him, and he put all six of them into my Lemus Exterminator that had a toe onto the objective. Now, my Liam Russ had failed a battle shot test, which meant he got plus one to hit or plus one to wound against it. I can't remember exactly what it was. And by the time he'd rolled his hits and wounds, he'd done four wounds to my Russ. And I had no CP for a reroll or anything like that. And so I just rolled my dice. But I was in cover and these things were AP minus three. So I was on a four up save. And I rolled two fours, a five and a six. My faith is my shield. The Emperor protects, Guardsmen. Oh, it was so funny. My opponent was just like, that should not have happened. <laughs> but this is what happens when you try and use mind bullets against the sacred vehicles of the Ashta Militarum, you know? Put your faith in steel, not in the Psyker. But that wasn't all. On the left-hand side, my opponent had brought on a Pyrovore and then got his Neuralictor out from the Ruin, and they flamed and charged the Catachans on the objective and brought them down to just nine survivors. On the right-hand side, it was a little quieter. The Neuralictor over there stayed hidden, not fancying its chances against the Dawn and 20 Kriegers, and 10 Gargoyles did drop down there, but my opponent did that really to help screen out my Cyclopses, which was still in reserve, because he didn't want me to come on back board edge and start getting some cheeky secondaries there so the guard had been hit hard as you all know he hit back even harder turn three was brutal on the left i fall back with the catachans and then between the lemurus battle tank and the other 20 man catachan blob i'm able to flame the Neuralictor into Oblivion, which lay down covering fire with the incinerators and fall back to the APC. And I was also able to destroy the Pyrovore. On the right-hand side, 
I was able to get my Kriegers round the flanks and between their shooting and charging and a bit of a mortar barrage to support them, I was able to take out both the Neurolictor and also the Gargoyles. Then in the center, it became a bit of a, a bit of a meat chopper, to be fair. The warriors were laid low by an exterminator and also the Rogal Dawn. Obviously, Exterminator teed up the Rogal Dawn to go second, who just that flat damage three from the Pulverized Cannon and the Oppressor Cannon. Warriors never stood a chance. But really, really the soul in the wound was the Exterminator in the middle that hadn't died, ended up putting its multi-melters into Death Leaper, who did die this time. He didn't make his um, invulnerable saves. And then it fired the Exterminator Cannon into the Zone of Thrones that had just come on. And my opponent just failed most of his saves. And in a single volley of high caliber auto cannon shells, a six strong Zone of Thrones squad was reduced to but a lone survivor. And frankly, that was the game. Because my opponent now, going into turn four, had an Exocrine a Biovore, a Zonothrope, a Neurotyrant, that was it. And all of that was essentially in his deployment zone. We played out the next two turns, but it was essentially Operation Mop Up. Find a bug hole, nuke it. And by the end of the game, it had been a crushing victory for the guard. Uh, I ended up with 98 points to the Tyranids, 72 points. So Tyranids still scored fairly well, but I was very surprised because my opponent was keeping track of the score on the app. And he was like, yeah, it's a big win to you. And I was like, oh, yeah, he went, yeah, I got 72 points. So, oh, well done, man. That's really good. And then he went, yeah, you got 98. I was like, what? How did I get 98? He went, yeah, you basically didn't miss a secondary and you were on three plus primaries pretty much every turn of the game. <laughs> so we purged the Xenos. We cast them back into the abyss from whence they came. But now we get to game number three, the final battle of the day. And I went up against what on paper was my toughest matchup of the event. It was time for the Leagues of Cheese. That's right, the Votan were going to rock my world. And if I wasn't careful, they were going to diggy dig me a grave. My opponent was a fantastic chap called Henry. And I just want to take a moment to personally thank and also apologize to him. Because it got to game number three, guys. And I have to admit, my energy just crashed. I was able to play the game and... Tactically wise, there was no issues, but I definitely was moving a little bit slowly. But thanks to Henry and also the TOs giving us a little bit of extra time, we were able to get through all five rounds. But I know that I was being frustratingly a little bit slow. And I just want to say a massive thank you to Henry for being very patient with me and a huge thank you to Dan and Will, the TOs, for giving us the extra time to make sure that we got the game done and we got it resolved properly as well. But having thoroughly lambasted myself in public, let's get to the list. There was an on here champion and another on here champion. There was a Carl with the appraising glare enhancement and then 10 Hearthkin warriors who broke down into two five man combat squads and they went in Sagittarius. There were four Sagittarius in total. Two of them had the Hearthkin in, two of them had Berserkers in them, and there were two five-man squads of Berserkers. There were also two six-man squads of the Brokia Thunderkin, <laughs> the exosuit guys with the Grav Cannons, and they all had the big Graviton Blast Cannons. There were then two big squads of the Dwarf Terminators, the Hearth Guard, and they were all 10-man strong and all armed with grenade launchers and Volkite disintegrators. And rounding the list out, there were two Pioneer bike squads. Each one had three bikes in them. Deployment was Crucible of Battle, 
The mission was vital ground, which meant there were only four objectives. The one in the middle went bye-bye, and the twist was sweet and clear, meaning everyone had sticky objectives. As for deployment proper, I put my Catachans with Strachan and an Exterminator on the right flank. I put in the middle behind the big L-shaped ruin, the artillery and command blob. Then also just sort of middle left, I put another exterminator and the battle tank. These are kind of in a central position where they can help either flank out and they can kind of cover both objectives quite comfortably. And then over on the left hand side, um, towards the more sort of northern part of my deployment zone, I put both creep blobs and the Rogal Dawn. As for the kin, they put a big blob of Terminators and also uh, exosuit Graviton guys in reserve. On the board, on the right hand flank opposite my Catachans, they put a 10 man Terminator unit and a Sagittar with five Hearthkin in it. In the middle, they put another Sagittar and a Pioneer unit, and that Sagittar has got uh, Berserkers in it. And then towards the left, towards the northern flank, as it were, they put, um, holding their home objective, they have a five man unit of Hearthkin Warriors. I think they started off in the Sagittar and turn one got out and just sat on that objective the rest of the game, pretty much. So they had two Sagittars, one with Berserkers in, a unit of Pioneers, and also an Exosuit squad as well. One important thing to know about the deployment overall is both sides made sure that no matter how far the Sagittarius moved, no matter how far the Lehman Russes moved, no one was going to get line of sight with the main guns on each other turn one. It was a very cagey deployment from both sides. We then roll the dice to see who's going to get first turn and the guard sees the initiative. Glory to the first man to die. I was quite happy with that. My opponent didn't want first turn because he thought, oh, whoever goes first is going to have to move out and expose a bunch of stuff. But that's not true. My battle tanks basically stayed still. The only exception being the Rogal Dawn went up towards the north and managed to get a cheeky long range shot with its oppressor cannon onto a Sagittar and did three wounds to it. But apart from that, my tanks, my big assets, they stayed nice and safe. And the infantry, well, on the right hand side with Strachan and the Catachans, they scout moved and then moved, just normal moved, onto the objective. But they were holding it from within a big line of sight blocking ruin. Now, I was quite clever with how I did this movement. Essentially, Strachan's unit was holding the objective from one side of the ruin, but they were just far enough away from the wall where my opponent wasn't able to fight through it. The other unit of Kachans were essentially screening them from the rear. They probably could be seen after a turn or two of Votan movement, but my opponent would have to go through the rear 20-man blob of Kachans to get to the actual unit that was holding the objective. You might be thinking to yourself, well, surely your opponent would just hold the objective from the other side of the ruin because the majority of it is exposed. Here's the thing. The unit opposing the Kachans is a unit of Terminators. They're only one OC each. And so even if he gets all 10 on the objective, that's only 10, maybe 11 OC with the character. I've got about nine Kachans that are towing onto that objective from my side of the ruin. And I can make those cash jans, they're OC2 each, that's 18 OC already. But if somehow my opponent manages to get more than 18 OC on that objective, I can use duty and honor. Making my cash jans 3 OC each, giving me a comfortable 25 plus objective control on that objective, on that primary. My opponent has to come round and has to go through the screening squad before he can start taking me off that objective. And that is a long way for him to go. He's only got little legs and it doesn't help when the main unit that he's got over there to try and do that job, which is his big Terminator unit, is getting pounded by the Basilisk every single turn. That, the Basilisk had one target all game and just shot those Terminators for the first two or three turns. And they were going at a crawl. My opponent was like rolling his advance dice and just barely going anywhere. So the Bazaars slow the Terminators down. The Catachan secure the objective on the right. Uh, in the center, I didn't do anything. My opponent wasn't going to deep strike down there. Turn one with his uh, second Terminator blob. And on the left, 
One Catatan unit moved, moved, moved onto the objective. And then the other Catatan unit just moved up behind, but they were still hidden out of line of sight by the Ruin. I then, in my opponent's command phase, because I had a spare CP to burn for this, I used my Death Corps Marshal on the unit of Kriegers that's on the objective, and I told I used Inspired Command to give them take cover. They had take cover, and they were in cover because of the, because of the Ruin, you couldn't see the whole unit which meant they were on a three up save with a five plus feel no pain, making them very difficult for my opponent to shift. As for my damage output, well, like I said, I chipped a few wounds off a of Sagittar and I took a wound or two off one of the Pioneer squads with my Mortars. And then I think the Basilisk, it slowed down the Terminators and then also killed one of them. That was it. But I didn't need to do a lot of damage. I now had ridiculous amounts of objective control on the objective or near the objective that my opponent had to come to me to get rid of. And because of the layout of the terrain and my opponent's unwillingness to just throw all of his units into the jaws of my firepower, Rotan turn one was very quiet. One unit of pioneers had scout moved and then they moved again and they got into the middle of the board and they peppered up the Krieg blob that was holding the objective, killing a few of them. I think I lost about three or four of them. But then I used the medipack in my turn and brought a couple of them back. So that, that wasn't so bad. Another unit of Pioneers and his two Sagittars, one with Berserkers in, uh, went up to towards the Kriegers again. But they couldn't draw line of sight. And then in the, in the south, on the Katachan flank, the Terminators moved and advanced. And they managed to get up to the edge of the, of the wall. But that was it. I lost a few Kriegers, no other damage. A very quiet turn one. Turn two for the guard, and I dug in. My Katachans, both squads took take cover, and they just sat in their defensive position. My opponent had to come to me to deal with it. And then in the center, I pushed forward a unit of mortars, because I didn't want my opponent to deep strike down there and start getting some extra fire lanes in the center, which might have been able to draw line of sight onto the Katachans in the south or the Kriegers in the north. So I just moved, moved a bunch of um, mortars into the center, basically right up next to his, his pioneers. Then over on the Krieg front, I moved another 20-man blob from behind cover, that one that I sort of was, was hailing the first blob, Bravo blob, we should say, and they moved on to the objective and they had take cover again. So now I had two Krieg blobs on the objective. But I decided the best form of defense was attack. And I got my other Krieger, the one that had been peppered up slightly, to push through the wall. I didn't want my opponent to just have the freedom to maneuver around me and to pick all of the fights. I wanted to keep him slightly off balance. Maybe it was a bit aggressive. Maybe it was a bit of a mistake. My Kriegers were safe where they were. My opponent would have had to come the other side of the wall to deal with all of the objective control. So it probably was unnecessary aggression, but I thought it was a risk I could take. And by going through the side of the wall, I could get rid of one of his pioneer units and I could also uh, charge and uh, start trying to deal with them in combat or also start getting into his Sagittarius and stuff. In the pew pew phase, the spare firepower of the Dawn, like the Stubbers and the Multi Melters, and Bravo Blob was able to kill the Pioneers, whilst the main firepower of the Dawn, the Pulverizer and the Oppressor Cannon and the Auto Cannon, were, was able to kill a Sagittar. This is when I realized that while Sagittars are annoying with Toughness 10 and 9 wounds, actually, against this particular army, it was brilliant. Because I only needed to get three failed saves through on those Moon Buggies, and they just popped. Because all of my big guns are like damage three. If they'd been the other way around, it would have made very little difference to my wounding capability. But it would have meant I needed that extra shot through. But it just felt like those little buggies were getting popped very easily by my big guns. But that really was the main damage from the shooting. The Basilisk again slowed down the Dwarven Terminators that were slowly making their way towards the Katachan Castle. And then we got into combat. I charged my Alpha Krieg Blob through the wall and was able to between... Uh, they had a bit of shooting as well. So there was a bit of shooting, a bit of bayonet work. And we were able to bring the Pioneers down to one bike on one wound. 
It then goes to Votan turn two. The very, very slow hard guard Terminators move and advance and they get a big advance and they're able to actually get a toe onto the objective held by the Cat Chance. They're, they're not holding it. The Cat Chance massively out objective control them, but they're getting pretty close now. Another turn and they might start being able to make things happen. My opponent also uh, gets a Sagittar with five uh, Hearthkin and they actually get round the flank and are able to see into the Kachan castle and his Sagittar in the middle with the Berserkers. The Berserkers jump out and they're looking to land a charge up on the Kachan castle as well, both going into the screening Kachan squad. That's exactly what they do and between a bit of shooty and a bit of chargey, that Kachan mob uh, does lose about... Uh, about 10 people. The Berserkers, they, they hit quite hard, but it's a few strength nine attacks. And so these Katachans aren't, uh, they haven't got any tokens on them or anything, no grudge tokens. So they're not getting plus one to hit or plus one to wound or anything. And so the Berserkers kill, I think about uh, about seven Katachans and then the Hearthkin are able to kill another two or three. The center is a little quiet, just a Sagittar sneaks in and uh, it does a little bit of bolt cannon kind of fire into the mortars, wiping two of the bases out, but one of the bases does live. Uh, it also fires a few shots off from its pseudo las cannon into the dawn, but just misses with the shots. Um, I do pop smoke. And then we get to the exosuit guys. They move and advance through the wall, so they can't shoot me this time, but they are getting in position where they're going to start threatening that objective that my Kriegers are holding. And my opponent falls back and shoots and charges with a stratagem on his final Pioneer. And between that shooting and also some shooting from the Sagittar, they do whittle that blob down and uh, basically bring them down to about half strength. But as we go into battle round three, it becomes obvious that the Votan are on the back foot. Because I score another 12 primary points. I scored 12 turn 2 and I scored 12 turn 3. The Votan only scored 2 for holding their home objective in their turn 2. And they're only going to score another 2 in their turn 3. So they are so far behind on the primary game. And they're only going to have turn 4 and turn 5 to switch it around. And they're quite slow and they've not got great places to bring their reinforcements in. Because of my aggressive Krieg push in the north, they can't get the guys in where they want up there. Because of the annoying mortars in the middle, they can't get the guys in there. Even though only one base left over, that's all that I need. And because of the way the Kachan castle is set up in the south, sure, that's probably the best place to bring them in, but they still can't bring them in on the objective. I realize that to win the game, I just need to do what guard do best, and that is hold the line. My Katachans in the south, they fall back. Unfortunately, they do catch an overwatch from the Terminator blob, and most of them are wiped out. But it's all right, there's a few survivors. That kind of plays into my hand for reinforcements. Draken's blob is perfectly intact, though. Between their flaming and their shooting, they actually kill all of the Berserkers and then they charge into the Hearthkin that had poked their way around the corner and Strachan picks up all five in that squad. He just goes first and just wipes them out. So a lot of the little stuff has been dealt with, but there's still a big block of Terminators. Well, that's all right. We know exactly how to deal with them. Firstly, we use the Mortar from the Command Squad to shoot them and we hit them. Because the command squad's in a blob with the Katachans, it means that they've got the regiment keyword and I'm able to use fields of fire. This means that now I've got plus one AP on that Terminator blob in the south. I then fire the Exterminate into them as well, putting an extra AP on that unit with Withering Hail. And the Exterminator itself does pretty good. The flat damage three, the AP two, and the twin linked means that I'm able to knock down about three of the half guard. And then we go with the main battle tank. And because they've still got a toe on the objective, I'm getting full rerolls to hit. And now my battle cannon is AP minus three. Short with cover, it's AP minus two, but that's a four up save. I roll the number of shots and I get the big six. Hitting on threes, 
Four re-rolls. I've stayed still. The lethal hits are there as well. And I knock down most of that unit. I think there's maybe a couple of them left. Which the Basilisk then hits them for a third time. And finishes off the last one or two Terminators that are there. And so that big threat in the south is gone. The Berserkers are gone. And also the little Halfkin are gone. And the Sagittar gets killed by um, the Exterminator that's in the south as well. Just gets picked up. And so now the south is completely free of enemy units. I think there's like one Carl there. And that is it. Things don't go much better for the Votan in the middle the one sagittar that is there ends up getting blown apart by the dawn it's happy to just keep slinging damage three shots into them and then the final unit of pioneers the one that's just on like one wound is finished off by uh, the mortars the kriegers up there actually fall back through the wall and they use their uh, medipack to get a few more guys back in the unit so i have in total between 30 and 35 kriegers on the objective and I have um, the Kriegers up there. Alpha Blob gets three reinforcements back from the Medipack. And so it continues pushing forward. It charges into the Sagittar and the Exosuit guys in an attempt to try and tie them up. Bravo Blob just digs in on the objective. We go over to Votan turn three and it's a little precarious. They've only got the Exosuit guys and a Sagittar up in the north. And the middle is clear apart from there's like five berserkers hiding behind a wall and then the south is empty right not quite my opponent brings his terminator his second unit and he deep strikes them down in the south and he also puts the exosuit guys from shield reserve down there as well he's going for that southern objective one way or another in the north he uses the stratagem that allows him to fall back shoot and charge on the thunderkin the exosuit guys so, actually, I didn't tie anything up. I made him burn a CP, but <laughs> that was it. Those guys that did fall back and shoot and charge, what they did is they fell back. They blasted the Rogal Dawn, but it only took eight wounds. Between the fact that I was able to uh, pop smoke on it and the fact that it's got its ablative armor and the fact that it's just got a lot of wounds and it was it's on a three up save because these grav guns are only ap minus two and it, it takes a shitload of wounds but i get lucky on my saves and i only take eight damage and the rogal dawn is for all intents and purposes fully operational in the south with the catachans unfortunately because i charged the hearthkin warriors a couple of catachans were exposed from the castle and they get deleted. The Terminators with their Volkites and their Mortars just pick them all up. But Cat, but Strachan does actually survive. The Carl charges Strachan and tries to kill him in single combat. But I pass all of my invulnerable saves. I laugh gleefully to myself and put four wounds on the Carl, who then passes all his invulnerable saves. Ah, it is an equal fight. Unfortunately, the Thunderkin that had come in from reserve down there do pick up my Lehman Rust Exterminator down there. So how the tables have turned, I cleared the south and now my opponent has cleared it back. Unfortunately, whilst it had been a mighty effort from the kin, it was their last hurrah because they had had to go all in. And whilst they'd done some damage, they had exposed their units and the guard firepower punished them. In the north, the Rogal Dawn, Bravo Blob, and the survivors of Alpha Blob were able to kill the last Sagittar and easily pick up Thunderkin. The flat damage three of the Pulverizer Cannon and the Auto Cannon and the Oppressor Cannon just made short work of the Exosuits. Even though they've got three wounds each, it just, it's a three up save that kills them, man. And then the multi-melters and all of the melters and crack grenades and everything else went into the Sagittar and yeah, it just, they're tough, but you throw enough shit at the wall and they do go down. That cleared out the north. There was nothing left over there. In the middle, there had been some Zerkers. They'd actually charged in to my other Lemus Exterminator, but uh, it uh, they hadn't killed it. 
they're only like strength nine so they were like trying to wound it on fives they hadn't managed to do much and in return the exterminator had overwatched them a little bit and then uh, I shot them and I shot them with my heavy bolter and my multi melts and my stubber that cleared the rest of them out and then my main exterminator cannon had been able to go over into the second unit of terminators which had turned up uh, I actually managed to kill a few of them as well again with the eight shots and the twin links sizing them down not too difficult to do and the battle cannon well I set the same combo up again mortar for, uh, fields of fire plus withering hail plus battle cannon plus blast and i was able to basically knock down most of those terminates i think there might have been one or two left my opponent rolled terribly on his armor saves and they just fell apart the last thing to mention was the exosuit guys were left at the final unit that was that had come in from reserve in the south but i hit them uh, with the basilisk and that not only slowed them down, but I also managed to kill one of them as well. And so we get to the end of guard turn four. And all that the vote I've got left on the board is that unit of exosuit guys. And that was it. Because I should have mentioned that the Lord Solar blob came to Strachan's rescue. I charged around the corner and took out the Kyle. Lord Solar defeated him in single combat. And then the five Hearthkin warriors that have been sat on my... Um, opponents on objective were taken out by some respawning um, Cathachans. They came back on the board and just flamed them off. And as it was a foregone conclusion at this point, and we were basically running over a little bit on the game, it wasn't a problem. Dan was there just keeping an eye on us whilst everyone else was packing up. Uh, we just pulled the cards for my opponent's turn four and then both of us turn five. Um, I was able to score some of mine. Um, sadly, Henry was only able to score like one of his. And so the final result was 88 points to the guard and 47 points to the Votan. And there we have it. End of the day. Three games of competitive 40k played and three victories for the Emperor's true finest. And I just have to say that this whole thing was quite eye-opening. Firstly, I felt like the list had done exactly what I had wanted it to do. At no point did I feel like I wasn't in control. I felt like I always had the initiative. Sure, there was the occasional bit of dicey luck, but by and large, I felt like I out objective controlled my opponents and even if I lost a blob or two, I always had a little bit more infantry to scrounge up. I had no issue scoring secondaries the entire day, again, apart from that first game with the cold open. And then the firepower was fine. I never felt like I was overly reliant on it, but I always felt like I had enough to get the job done. But if I was to have one main takeaway, it's that the meta feels so elite right now. I always had more objective control than my opponents. It felt like everyone else was focusing on the big flashy units and not really taking much battle line. And I honestly think it punished every single one of my opponents. Because when their killing power didn't do what, exactly what they wanted, or when their units didn't last as long as they wanted, they didn't have anything to fall back on. And I felt like on every game, I was able to dominate on primary. And not only did that mean I was scoring more points, but I was denying points to my opponents as well. The other thing that I noticed was how fragile a lot of enemies felt. I'm not talking individual units, I'm talking overall lists. There was a couple of times when I would have one big turn where I would hit my opponent and maybe kill two units. And it felt like I'd just kick the legs out from underneath them. I'd be rolling my dice, I'd be in the zone, my opponent would be picking the models up and I'd take a step back, look around, suddenly it felt like the board was empty on the other side. I'm not sure if this is just the current meta thing to do and perhaps guard are anti-meta, or I'm not sure if people are maybe falling into the trap of, well, if you don't need battle line, don't bother taking it. But either way, I can categorically say that by having the redundancy in my list, and having that resiliency built in, I felt it gave me a significant advantage over all of my opponents. But of course, 
All of this is just like my opinion, man. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. How would you change this list? What would you do to tweak and improve it? And what are your overall takeaways from the games that were played? If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to smash that like button. And if you want to see more content like this, make sure you subscribe to never miss an episode. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is a lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patrons. You guys are amazing. Truly the lifeblood of the channel. I could not do Mordian Glory full time without the incredible and generous support of my members. So thank you guys so much. And last, but certainly not least, I want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier Patreons. These are the War Masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the Call of Duty. So a massive thank you to Bon Bon Vert, Mad Larkin, Mark Panconi, RJ Scorpion, Swordfish Trombone, John Stubbs, Nick Walsh, Diesel Fox, August Vardy and the Tommies. Thank you guys. Your incredible support makes a huge difference and it is a big part of how I'm able to do Mordian Glory full time. But that's all for now. Thank you for watching and of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>